Hey guys, welcome to RC Video Reviews. Today we're doing a live stream, and the reason I'm doing a live stream is because I wanted to give you the opportunity if you had questions to ask while I was kind of covering the material that we're going to cover today. And uh, what we're covering today <clears throat> is a little bit of a design based on this idea that sometimes you might be using some high current servos. And there are options out there for high current uh, setups. You know, if you have an airplane, like a 3D plane that's got some high power servos and you're drawing some amperage, there are boards out there called power distribution boards, or I think that's the main, the main power expanders. That's another phrase you'll hear for these types of things. And um, the problem with it is in the hobby that some of them can be very, very expensive. I mean, on the order of $250, you know, that, that high. Now, that said, I, I want to make sure we do an apples to apples comparison because <clears throat> that's the favorite thing people come in and say, as I say, but the one that you were talking about does this and this and this and yours does this and this. So that's the thing, right? And this one, this is just a very simple power expander. There are some dip switches in there, and I'm going to show you what those do in just a minute. We're going to talk about that. And I'm going to, we'll, we'll, I'll show you how this board operates and I'll show you what all these connections are about. So we'll get into all the details here, but the thing that I want to do is to make sure that we're doing an apples to apples comparison. And I want to characterize this device simply as a power and signal bus. That's it. It's a power and signal bus. So what that means is that the signal, let me get my, uh, I'm going to get a pointer out here real quick. So the signal the signal pins are shared. So if you notice, if you look at this as two halves, so there's draw an imaginary line right down the middle of this device. You got the left half and the right half. So on the left hand side, the signal pin, you can see there's an S right there. That refers to this row of pins. These are the signal pins. And then you'll see a positive sign right here that refers to this middle row. And then the negative sign refers to this row. Now, what I will tell you is that power and ground are common on all of the positive and negative, and I'll show you that in just a minute. But power and ground are common on all of these and all of these sides. So on this side, it's reverse. You got a positive and a negative. This is the positive row, this is the negative row. So power is common on all middle pins here and here, and ground is common on all these end pins on the outboard side here and here. Those are all common. The only thing that's not common is the signal pin. The signal pins are not common. So number one bridges directly to number one with a caveat that I'll touch on momentarily. Number two bridges to number two and so on all the way down the line. So this is down to uh, eight channels. It's an eight channel servo power expander is what that is. Now you'll also notice on the sides and the bottom, they have these XT30 connectors. You might say, well, wait a minute, why do they have two? And that's because you can bridge them together. You can run them in parallel. We'll cover that in just a minute as well. We'll get into all of this stuff. I'm just trying to give you a quick physical tour of the device. So um, now regarding the, the dip switches in the middle, this little row of dip switches kind of acts like a rudimentary mixer. And what this means is that if you look at dip switch number one right here, that pin number one, what that's going to do and by the way, this is a live stream. I didn't check my audio. Can you guys give me an audio check real quick? I think it looks good, but just give me an audio check if you don't mind real quick. Uh, so anyway, the uh, signal, this is a rudimentary mixer. So basically what happens is when this switch is in the off position, which is which it is now. Thanks, Fred, for the audio check, man. Appreciate it. So when that switch is in the off position, this pin number one is isolated electrically from pin number two. If I move this pin number one, if I just flick that over like that, now what I've done is I've linked the signal on one or the, the current, the path, the electrical path on number one to number two. So now anything that I put in terms of a signal on this pin number one right here will show up as a signal on pin number one and two on this side. And you can bridge these all the way down. So what happens is the pin connects to the, uh, it connects the signal pin to the pin below it. So that's what's happening here. If you if you turn one on, it connects one and two. If you turn two on, that connects two and three. I actually haven't done a test to see if you can daisy chain these all the way down so you could wind up with eight, eight uh, 
individual pins bridge together. I haven't tested that yet. We can. We can test that in just a moment. But that's the physical tour. One other thing I'll point out about this is that you can take these screws out. I think they're M4 screws. You can take these out and use a longer screw so that you can use all four mounting holes to mount this board to your model. So they use two screws to keep the case together, and that's fine. But if you want to mount all four of these, you, you can do that simply by taking this M4 screw out and putting in a longer screw, and that'll work just fine. Uh, I'd still use the, uh, you know, the nylock nut there to keep the case pinched together. I would still do that, but that would be fine if, if you did that. Okay, so the next thing I want to do real quick is take you over to the workspace, and I want to, I want to take a look at the specs on on the uh, board, I want to cover the specs so you guys can see you know, what I'm talking about in terms of current handling. Um, but you guys also know that I picked up a new sponsor and I do want to get into the material. However, I hope you give me the opportunity to pay the bills and stick with me for just a minute. So we'll cover this just in just a moment. But first for you electronics gurus and tinkers out there, check out PCBWay.com. PCBWay has a full suite of services available to make your ideas a reality, including PCB manufacturing and assembly, CNC machining, 3D printing, and injection molding. When you're ready to order, PCBWay provides instant quotes, real-time production tracking, and you can order as few as five boards at a time, which is great for early stage projects. If you need an experienced partner to help bring your ideas to life, check out PCBWay.com. I have a link in the description if you'd like to give them a look. I have a link in the description if you want to check them out. I don't know why the video cut out like that, so I'm sorry about the ads. I know the ads aren't fun, but hopefully you guys understand the nature of that. It's to help me pay the bills, and it lets me do stuff like this, so having a sponsor is good. Okay, so now let's get into the material on the, on the specs on this board. So this is the... I, get, I got these boards at servocity.com, and they're called, if you look at the title, they're called a servo power distribution board, eight channel. Here's the deal. They go for 12 bucks, so $12 versus 150 So kind of interesting to me when I saw that. And I want to get into the bottom part here where you can see the specifications that they say on the board. Now, I have to caveat this by saying I have not personally loaded the device up with 30 amps and checked it to see if it can sustain that. But the claim, the specification claim on this board is up to 15 amps continuous current, which is substantial. 15 amps on servos, that's quite a bit. And then it can support a max current of 30 amps um, uh, peak. And that's probably, they don't really specify it in, in the page anywhere, but I'm just gonna go with the standard about 30 seconds. I would That's how much I would trust it, it's about 30 seconds at peak. That just tends to be how a lot of these electronics work. So that's a quick look at the specs. I do have a link for these in the description. This is not an affiliate link, so this is just a straight up reference for you. Uh, this this one is a affiliate, uh, not an affiliate link. It's just a product link in the description if you want to grab a couple of these and test for yourself. But twelve ninety nine, that's a pretty good budget option for power distribution, as far as I'm concerned. Okay, so those are the specs on the board. The next thing I wanted to do was give you guys a look at the electronics. Uh, I told you we would take a look at the electrical circuitry. So all I'm going to do here is give you an opportunity to see what happens in the uh, in the signal path. Just because I told you I would, you know, show you. So all I'm going to do here is I've got to, I've got it set on continuity and I'm going to hit the I'm just going to set this on the side so I can get on my way and I'm just going to show you the ground. So here's the ground and obviously ground is normally common. You guys know that, I'm, but I'm just going to show you because I said I would. OK, so there's I, I hopefully you can hear the tone, but it is definitely beeping. That is definitely a tone. I'm getting a tone. So that's ground all the way up here, all the way down to here. We'll check this one as well. And there I've got tone again. So that's definitely common, no doubt. And then same thing on the power rail. I'll hit power over here on the left-hand side. And we'll hit power over here on the right-hand side. Yep, I got tone. So there's continuity there. And I'll also, we'll just pick a random one. We'll do the middle. So yep, there's, there's tone there. Now we'll do signal. And I'm going to hit signal port number one. I've moved my switch back over to the off position. So we'll do one. I'll just click that on. And there's continuity. Now if I move to number two no continuity, all right? So if I move to number two, no continuity. If I move the left pin to number two, there we've got continuity. Okay, so that proves the point. That's what this is all about. It's about, it's about um, providing a signal bus and a power bus over the two sides of the controller. Okay, 
Now the other thing I said we could do is we could turn on, turn on, I'm just going to turn on a couple of them. I'm not going to do all eight. I guess if it proves the point on, I did four. So there's four. All I want to do now is test continuity from one to four because I moved all the switches over. So I'm going to put the uh, left probe here on number one and I'm going to touch number four. One, two, three, four. Yep, I got tone there. So it does work. It acts as a, every time you flip one of these over, it connects whatever is above to whatever's below. So I guess there's eight. We can do eight. Why not? <laughs> what the heck? Why not? Yep, there it is. There's tone all the way down. So yep, you can bridge all eight signal interfaces on one side if you wanted to. I don't know why you'd want to do that, but you know, maybe, I don't know, maybe you have a use case to do it. Um, so there's the electrical, there's the electrical setup on this. And, um, that, that's the main thing I wanted to show you in terms of the physical tour of this little power distribution board. Okay. So now we'll set that aside and I'm going to show you guys the setup that we're going to use on the radio. Uh, by the way, I get asked about these all the time. They're in the description. This is an affiliate link. If you like my jeweler screwdrivers, I like them because they're metal, but I get asked about these quite a bit. And there's a description in the link in the, uh, sorry, there's a link in the description for these. If you want to check those out. Okay. Now let's bring the radio in and let's do some radio stuff. There we go. Just had to zoom out a little bit. I got to clear the desktop just a touch. And now what I'm going to do is bring in the, um, the setup. So I have it already wired. I have another one of these wired already. And the only thing I've done here, let's, um, you know, just to make it, just to make it real clear on what's going on. I want to make sure we talk about the, the physical setup here. The way I consider this or look at it is this is a, a story of two halves, right? On one half, you I have the outputs. So these are the outputs going to the model. And on this half, I have the inputs. These are the inputs coming from my receiver, okay? In this case, I'm using a Flysky IA6B, and this is using AFH DS2A as a protocol. And I use that because this protocol is available. There are a couple of reasons I used it. Why am I not getting my... Uh... Sorry, guys. I'm just trying to work on some cable management here. There we go. Now it's not pulling on it all the time. There we go. That's better. Okay. So the reason I use this one is because this protocol, AFHDS2A, is available in your multi-protocol module on the radio. So I'll click on the model settings, and we'll look at the internal RF. And you can see right here, I've got FlySky 2A, and that's already bound to this receiver. So... The other reason I used it is because this is kind of a budget receiver. This receiver is only $16, and it is a full-range receiver. An AFH DS2A is a known working good protocol. It works well. And these are also 12-bit receivers. Now, on this particular radio, I don't have 12-bit gimbals, obviously, so I can't take full advantage. But if you had, a say, 11-bit gimbal like the AG01s, you could achieve 11 bits down to the receiver. And you guys know, if you follow the channel, I've been on that for a while. I'm trying to find these solutions that give me the highest resolution possible. So you can get 11 bits on this one if you have the right gimbals. Edge supports it. So we know that it is 11 bits. And I have tested this uh, with my protocol, with my, pro that's not a protocol analyzer, with my resolution testing card in my software. I have tested this and it is definitely 11 bits. No, no, no question. Okay, so all I have here just to give you a look at the electronic layout is, uh, this is a typical setup, right? So all I have is on channel one, I have a left aileron. On channel two, the right aileron. Channel three is throttle. Uh, channel four is rudder. Channel five is the other aileron. I said aileron twice. One and five are ailerons. Two, three, four, elevator, throttle, rudder. Okay, now I'm clear. Okay, so that's the setup. And then on the left-hand side, all you do is you match the pin. So if you have pin number one on your receiver going to your aileron, say your port aileron, then on your board, you simply connect pin number one to the port aileron, which is what I've got there. Uh, these labels too, I have a link for this in the description. I've said for so long with RCVR1 here in my model that I needed to label my leads. Uh, I haven't seen Robert yet, but uh, Robert would be proud because I finally labeled leads. This makes it so I can move the model to different devices a lot easier because otherwise I'm testing every time. And there's a link for this too. I'm not going to do a review today on this, but this is called the Nimbot. There's a link for this in the description. If you want to make these labels, it's actually pretty cool. That's a pretty cool little device. Um, so it'll help you clean up what's going on inside your model. 
So anyway, that's the layout. Receiver on the right, so your input's on one side, your output's on the other. And then all I'm gonna do is move the radio into view and let you guys see, that I'm gonna move the aileron. So there's the left aileron. Let me tilt the model because it's a lot easier to see the movement when I do that. So there you go, you can see the, the model is moving up and down. There's the elevator, there's the ailerons, and there's my rudder moving back and forth. And the, the physical layout for the power comes from the bottom. I would like to show you guys eight volts. The problem is these particular test servos that I have are only good to six. So right now I'm only feeding six volts into this, but the device, the build a power distribution board can support up to 15 volts. So that should be more than enough for any servo you have. And the other thing I'll point out is that there is no power regulation on this board at all. So whatever you feed into this lead at the bottom, that's what your servos and your receiver are going to see. There is no power regulation in here at all. So make sure whatever you plug into the input line on this, um, it doesn't blow up your voltage on your servos or your receiver. Okay, before I go any further, that is like the bulk of what I had to show you today. I wanna check questions and then I wanna show you because you stuck around, I'm gonna show you some extra goodies, okay? I'm gonna show you some stuff with SBUS and I'm gonna show you some stuff with a sensor. So let me just check the questions real quick. Um, I don't, good audio sounds good, it's fine, good sound, good. Okay, no questions. Wow, I must be thorough today or you guys are sleepy. All right, since there are no questions, I'm gonna go ahead and move on to the next part and that's this one. I wanna show you guys this too, because if you haven't seen this yet, I just did a Fly Sky sensors video because they sent me a bunch of sensors, but these I bought on my own. These are voltage sensors. And here's what I like about these. These are also 12 bucks. So I'm gonna stick this in here and this just goes in the sensor lead on the receiver. And now uh, you can take your positive and ground wires and plug them into a battery. So I'm gonna do that real quick. I'm gonna just take the positive and negative. So I'll put negative here. I'll put positive here. So if you go flying, right, that'd be your setup when you go fly. And then if you look at the radio, what ends up happening is you get a voltage sensor right there. 11.5, 11.49, that's my voltage on my battery. So there, here's why I showed you guys that, right? I've got, now I've got, I've got the setup that for me, this is what I want in all of my models from here on out. I want voltage, I, I want voltage. I don't care anymore right now. It doesn't matter what I fly, it's gonna have voltage one way or another. So I'm gonna have a voltage sensor. And the reason for that is because voltage doesn't lie. You, if your voltage drops below your threshold, you need to land the plane. And you don't have to worry about calculations or calibrations or anything like that, because the voltage sensors are normally pretty accurate. They're close enough, that's for sure. So I don't wanna get into an accuracy debate and say, well, it's uh, 0 0.05 volts off. So nah, I don't care about that. It's close enough for flying purposes and that's why I want it. So let's get back on track here. We're talking about a 12 volt voltage sensor, a $16 receiver. So we're at 28 bucks, let's round up, let's call it 30. And we're talking about a $13 board. So $43 and I've got a high current setup that is full range, 11 bit with a known over the air protocol that works on clearly an operating system that we all love. And I've got voltage and I've got up to 30 amps. So 43 bucks, and we're talking about a pretty comprehensive setup that should do the job. I have to caveat, and the reason I say should is because I have not loaded this to 30 amps. So you guys know my deal, it's all about video evidence, right? Do what you say you're gonna do, so I like to test these things. To that end, I did buy a servo sensor that I will be flying with one of these devices in a big plane soon. The servo sensor goes up to seven amps. So. If it works and I and I can peak that servo, then I'll probably put four of them in and run a four different servo sensors if I can get the telemetry to work out. So that's on the radar, that's on my game plan, my long-term plan, but I do wanna caveat because um, I always tell you guys I try and do video evidence. It's always about video evidence for me, show me. If you can show me on the video, then you know we know we've got something. If you can't show me on the video, then you know it's so much of this. That's why I'm caveating and saying that I haven't tested it. Okay, that pretty much wraps this part up. I have an SBUS configuration I could show you guys if you're interested in seeing it. I don't know, I'm gonna check the comments. You guys seem kind of quiet today. So if there's no interest in seeing it via SBUS, um, I, I'll, I'll just skip that part. If there is interested in seeing the SBUS version, I've got it right here. I could easily show you that um, if you'd like to see the SBUS version of this. 
Okay, the other XT connection, that's a good question. Danny says, what's the other XT connection for? And I did mean to cover that. So here's the other XT connection. Thanks for the reminder, appreciate that. The idea behind this is that you can now bridge these together. So you can pop this one in, and now I've got uh, this board going in there as well. So I've got power, and if I bring my meter back in, I should be able to put my meter on and see the voltage on these top pins that I'm seeing on the bottom one. So I'm just gonna do, I'll do positive over here and we'll do negative over here. Oops, you guys can't see the voltmeter. There you go. So here's positive, negative, and there we go. 5.5 volts up top. So that's why you have two. You can easily convert this into a 16 channel layout. Very simple. All you would have to do now is just uh, use these as channels, you know, one through eight for your PWM input. And these would be channels uh, nine through 16. So there you go, 16 channels, and you can keep daisy chaining them. So if you need a much higher, uh, if you need a much higher uh, servo count, they daisy chain together, which is really cool in my opinion, because the XT30, no problems there, right? Plenty of current on the XT30 bridge, and this definitely makes it scalable. So I really like this uh, as an option. Another idea that I thought of too, by the way, just a concept is if you wanted to, you could go in and bridge one and two together, and then three and four, and that means these two pins become servo one, these two pins become servo two, and so on. So if you wanted even more current carrying capacity per pin, you could bridge these together. So if you put two of them together, you've got 16, you do eight pairs of two, now you could run two leads to your servo and have even more current going into the servo. So just another option, right? Uh, weight of the unit is 28 grams. So 28 grams for one of these, according to their channel, their website, uh, 20, sorry, 23 grams, 23 grams. All right. So um, it looks like uh, Mr. Skywriter says he'd like to see SBUS. Okay, I can show you guys SBUS. It's easy. So what I'm going to do on SBUS, because that really kind of cleans this configuration up some, is well, not really, because we still have to go PWM from the SBUS decoder, which in my case, I'm going to use the Hobby Eagle A3. In this particular instance, I'm going to use a Hobby Eagle A3 Super 2. So let me clean the desk up a little bit, just move some things out of the way. All right, so I've got a Hobby Eagle A3 Super 2 already configured for SBUS. And um, what I'm going to do is connect the SBUS right here. S bus, so that's S bus on my gyro, and that's gonna go into the S bus. We don't need the sensor, so let me get the sensor out of the way. That'll make the desk a little easier to navigate. Okay, so we take our S bus lead from our gyro, plug that into the servo lead on the A on the uh, IA6B. So there we go. That's plugged in now. Now we've got a, an S bus connection between the receiver and the gyro. Okay, so we no longer need all of this stuff. We can take this all off of the receiver. We no longer need that. However, we do need to go PWM from our Hobby Eagle to our board. And I'm gonna go down to one board. That'll make things a little easier to understand. And so now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna connect my aileron. We'll just do aileron and elevator. That should be enough to make the point, right? So we'll do aileron and elevator from my gyro, and we're gonna connect those to the aileron and elevator port on the power distribution board. Oops, not that one, that one. Okay, so there we go. Now we've got our power distribution. Okay, let's cover, let's cover this. I don't have this, I don't have the gyro set up on this model. So the gyro's on, that's why it's gonna do that. Okay, so the receiver now is connected via S bus via S bus to the gyro. Okay, so one connection from the receiver to the gyro. Now, because this gyro doesn't do throttle out, you could also run channel three PWM to your ESC. So if you wanted to bring in an ESC from the outside and connect it directly to channel three on your receiver, you can do that, no problem. So S bus to the gyro, and then from the gyro, we have output to the, to the pins on the power distribution board. And now if I move my aileron, I only have one aileron. These are dual channel ailerons. So I'm just moving the one. You can see it here. It's the port aileron that's moving. So port aileron and there's the elevator. Let me just pull it in so you can see it. There's the elevator going up and down. Okay, so that's S bus going from the receiver to the gyro and then from the gyro to the power distribution board. All right, S bus works. 
some of these boards, the power distribution boards, they take S bus in. So that's another comment that I know I'll see. Some people say, well, you don't need to do all that. You can just go S bus directly into the board. Okay. If you want to pay 180 bucks for it, go ahead. You know, if you want to pay 80 bucks for it, go ahead. That's fine. You know, it works. No, I'm not arguing about that. I have no argument. You know, it does work, but, um, if this is $12, <laughs> so, so that, that's the point. It, and that's the title of the video, right? It's, it's, it's high power on a budget. All right, let me check the comments then and we'll try and wrap this up. What's the range of the voltage sensor? The voltage sensor, oh, um, let me check that, Jeff. That's a good question. The range, give me just a moment. I'm gonna have to, I'm gonna have to uh, check that. Give me just one minute. One moment. The voltage sensor, let's see, I'll have to check. I believe it's 24 volts. I think it's good for up to 24 volts. That's my guess, but let me just double check. So if you're using them in parallel, what you can do is plug into one side of, of the receiver, right? Uh, let's see, voltage acquisition mod. Oh, I lied, it's 100 volts, that's right. I did actually put that on the desk, it's 100 volts. So 100 volts on that, and I did actually test that up to like 95 volts. I strung a bunch of batteries in series together, and I did see 90, like 90 volts on my desktop, and I took a picture of it. Uh, Ken says, quick question. I'm guessing when you use the bridging, you need to not present multiple inputs from the RX. Yeah, so, yeah, I mean, well, you can't. I mean, so if you if you bridge these together, what you, and actually, this is kind of a, I just realized, you know, based on that question, what a terrible example I gave. You really probably want the inputs to be on this side and the outputs to be on the side if you're going to use bridging. Because what it does is it connects this to the one lower below it. So you'd want your outputs over here and not the inputs. Okay, so for that clarification, um, what I would say is that your input is still only one wire, right? So if your gyro aileron is this channel right here, that's the, that is the only input. Um, I don't think you would want to try and reverse that and put two inputs on this side and run it to one output. That would probably be a catastrophe. So your inputs, I think, would be on... I, I should have done a better example. Um, but I wasn't bridging, so it didn't, it worked. <laughs> That's why I didn't flip it. But anyway, if your input is on this side and you bridge these two together, you'd only want these going to an output that you want, uh, you know, a, a, an output that you want to react to one signal. That's the way I'd phrase that. Hope, hopefully that makes sense. All right. That looks like the end of the question. So that is the end of the video. I don't see any reason to go any further than that. Um, all the links for everything you see, including, I get, this is another one that when I, whenever I do a video, if you guys have been around for a while, you already know about it, but for people who are newer to the channel, they don't know about this model. Um, I put a link to my model. This is an STL in, uh, it's a link to a video explaining how to get it. The model is hosted in my discord and I only have one simple rule. You cannot use it for monetization purposes. So if you're another YouTuber, you can't have this appear on your YouTube channel. Uh, but for personal use or educational use or for club use or any of that, you're free, free to download it and use it. And um, that's fine. I don't have any problems with that. There is a link in the description on how and where you get it. And um, this is just a very simple 3D print. It works great. I've been using this for a long time for testing and I absolutely love it. It's one of my favorite little toys on the bench to uh, test things out. I use it all the time. So if you're interested in that, I've got a link in the description. I've got links in the description for the receiver, for the power distribution board, for the voltage sensor, for my screwdrivers, and I think even the servos that I use in this airplane are all in the description. And uh, that's it. So I want to take, let's see, any other questions? So it can also be used, it is an advanced Y harness, so one channel to let's say flaps can have like two or three servos on that one flap. Yes, exactly, exactly. That's exactly the idea. It's a rudimentary bridge or mixer. Yes, that's exactly the point. So if you have several outputs that you want to react to one signal, let's say you have four things that you want. I already have four of them set up. I have eight actually. Let me move these back. So the way I have that set up right now, these four pins, numbers one, two, three, and four, all four of those would react to the signal coming off of this pin right here, number one, okay? So this signal pin number one would be telling number one, two, three, and four on this side what to do if you move all four of those switches over. That makes sense? Hopefully that makes sense. So yeah, that's a very good idea. If you're doing flaps or something like that, you can use just, you can use this as the mixer, you know, honestly, if you don't want to mix in your radio for some reason. So, yep. 
All right, guys. Well, hey, listen, I appreciate you watching. Thanks for letting me run the ad on PCB Way. Um, you know, like I said, they're, they're a good partner. They're helping the channel with income. So thanks to PCB Way for sponsoring the video. And thanks. For, thank you guys for your attention. If you like the material, make sure you hit the thumbs up, subscribe and notification bell. If you didn't like the material, thanks for watching this far and, and hanging out and asking questions. That's all I've got for today. Hope you enjoyed the content. Get out there and fly something.